morning, everybody. It is so good to have you here with me. Imagine if you have your vision as the car with the right team. Imagine how quick that vision will come into the footsteps. Something that was taking five years takes three months. This morning is all about the leadership and influence. influence. Good morning, good morning, everybody. This is the Inside Show again with your host, Carl Hendricks. This is a very laid back show, and what we discuss on this show every Tuesday and Wednesday is really issues of the matter. Things that matter in our lives and things that change our lives is very challenging, sometimes completely controversial, and sometimes we just go slow and gently, depends where we are. And I'm mindful this is, uh, by the way, Valentine's month. It's a <laughs> month of love and laughter and, yes. and hearts and all the beautiful things that you can do for those in marriage, for those in courtship. This is just a, a beautiful, beautiful month and also nice to be alive. Well, I just want to invite you again and uh, remember. Remember, please, please subscribe and hit that uh, that button, that bell there that will let you know every single time when we come online. Today, we've got a wonderful pack, pack, pack show here uh, entitled, Whose Land Is It Anyway? I've got two beautiful, great men of God here. Besides that, they love God and, and so very equipped. They're also very equipped with social justice issues. I do have Mr. Atifanel with me here and then Dr. Ruben R. Richards. Man, I cannot tell you how divine this is. I'm so excited for this. This gentleman is on, on set today. Um, I, I mentioned to Mr. Fanel this morning, I said, you know, it's, I'm like a little boy in a candy mm. shop. I'm so, so, so excited uh, to have him on Line. Just, just quickly uh, about uh, uh, Dr. R. Uh, Ruben Richards is uh, there's a few books on books out, and I'm just going to mention maybe two or so. The one is Gangsterism and Economic uh, Reconciliation in South Africa. This book is available. Uh, we'll hear from him on the set where we can get hold of him. Then Bullets or Ballads. This book is available. Mm. And then I'm first going to show you a pocket book, one that you can handle when, you, when you're in a taxi or waiting at a doctor just to glance through. Or if you just want to get in a quick debate, this is an ideal book to have. But the real, real stuff is Bastards or Humans. This is uh, volume one and volume two. So this is so, so, so important. And uh, for you, if you if you don't mind, just get these books out there. Um, I wonder if uh, let me just see, uh, close that and see if I can get it back online. Yeah. So uh, this morning, allow me first of all just to introduce uh, Mr. Arthur Fanel. You not a stranger in this studio. As a matter of fact, you every time when you hear, you cause problems. <laughs> and I just want to let uh, Dr. Richard know that uh, the, if there's any problems after the show. He is to be blamed because he, he is the culprit and he will remain the culprit. But uh, please just introduce yourself again. Uh, thank you so much, Doc, for the invite to be here this morning. I thoroughly enjoy the studio. I enjoy what we do here and enjoy what you do here. Mm. Thank you for rocking the boat, uh, slaughtering all the holy cows <laughs> so that we can eat them. So, uh, yes, I'm a business person. I'm an entrepreneur. I am also a pastor. And I have a very keen interest in giving the church a voice, an equipped voice, in matters that matter, the social justice and uh, current affairs. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here this morning and just to, to hear this colossus of a man, uh, Dr. Richards, unpack a lifetime of work and in empowering our viewers to find their own feet in the whole land debate. Tomorrow is a big day. It's the closing date for submissions on the expropriation bill. And so the timing of the show is so perfect. Thank you so much. So much, Doc. Let, let, me, just, let me just introduce the speaker to you. Uh, do you have time? Because this man, I, think, I tell you, this resume is like so long. It is like, uh, it will take our whole show. But I'm going to shorten it here for your comfort. Well, Dr. Ruben Richards is an author, a speaker and teacher. Uh, according uh, the, the document I have here, Ruben is a multi-skilled international, traveled and educated South African. 
born and raised in Cape Town and classified by apartheid as a Cape Colored. Funny enough, Dr. Richards, I was also a Cape Colored, but at that point in time, I've never, never been to Cape Town. <laughs> but I was declared <laughs> as a Cape Colored. <laughs> so Dr. Ruben started work as a clo- at the clothing factory, working and later completed a fit and turner uh, apprenticeship. In addition, he owes four degrees from three countries, USA, South Africa, Switzerland. I warn you off here. And so the graduate in 1995 with a PhD from the University of Cape Town as the first academically disadvantaged student admitted in the UCT in 1986, completed a full range of degrees from undergraduate to a doctorate in under 10 years. And I warn you, Hello. I warn you, didn't I warn you? <laughs> Didn't I warn you that this is a man, Doctor Ruben Ruben Richard? A warm, warm welcome to you. Thank you so much. Uh, please introduce yourself before I ask uh, the Honourable Atifanel just to to uh, pose the first question to you. Well, thank you very much for that warm and kind I'm welcome. Uh, I am from Cape Town, and they do call me other things here. Uh, but this is a this is a program for decent people, so we will leave all of those bad Cape Town labels. Uh, but thank you very much for the invitation. I look forward to this discussion. Audio, Jeff. Wish. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. There you go. It's a laid back program. Uh, it's a laid back program, and we will just flow as as you wish. Well, I'm going to ask. Uh, Mr. Fanel here just to pose the first question and see how far we get today in this hour. Thank you, Doc. Uh, Dr. Richards, land is right back in the center of the national agenda. Just before COVID hit us, every day in the newspaper, in the news, in parliament, in debates, it was the issue of expropriation without compensation. Before we get there, can we take two steps back and can you help us to understand how old the land question is? In political terms, we refer to the land question as the original sun. I used to think we must start talking from about the 1800s until I read your book and you say no, it starts 200 earlier, 200 years earlier at the first Koi Dutch Peace Convention. Can you go fetch us there and walk our viewer from there to about 94? Uh, I missed a little bit of what you said, but you want me to walk you through from, from this, the, the, the 1660 uh, land summit uh, in Cape Town? to 1994, where we are, to, and, and of course, where we are today. So just to, to reinforce what you said, the expert panel that's advising President Ramaphosa um, have written an a advisory document for him, a very extensive research document, and they said to the President, Mr. President, to understand the land crisis in South Africa, uh, we, we, we start in 1852 with the Sand River Convention uh, when black people lost their land. Now, the Sand River Convention is when uh, the Boers, the Afrikaners, decided to form the Transvaal Republic um, and, and black people then became aliens in the land of their birth. So say the expert panel. Now, that's all true and accurate. I'm not disputing that. But I'm saying that, a, a, I'm suggesting that a, a better way to start is, is at the beginning. And that beginning is when the Dutch first landed at the Cape uh, to set up a refreshment station in 1652. Now we all know the date, 1652, Jan van Riebeek arrives with his Dutch settlers and they set up camp uh, in Cape Town. Two important pieces of information uh, is, in, is necessary. The first is that the 1652 arrival of Van Riebeek was not the first time that Van Riebeek arrives at the Cape. He was here before. In fact, he was here four years before that 
and he did a physical tour of the Cape Peninsula. So he knew the lay of the land, he had seen the people, and the context of that visit was him being part of a, a fleet of ships that were on their way to Holland from uh, Indonesia, from Batavia, and he was on his way to being fired uh, by his company for corruption. Now that's just a side note, um, an important side note, I think. Uh, the important thing is that they had collected um, Dutch sailors who had been stranded on the shores of Cape Town for a year. Um, and this, these, these, these people were, were led by two captains, Captain Prout and Captain Janssen. And they were then collected a year later and taken back to Holland. When they got back to Holland, they wrote a report for the company that they worked for, the Dutch East India Company. And in that report, these two captains, Captains Janssen and, and Prout, make a recommendation that Cape Town should be used as a refreshment station for the Dutch company. And the mo they motivated their case to say there are skilled people who live there, and we will give those people a name in just a moment. Uh, they are skilled people who live there. They know how to look after cattle. They, they are. They have over a hundred years of experience in being hospitable to visitors who come visit Cape Town. And by the way, Cape Town is a busy port. I, I, I can't hear you, so um, you'll have to just help me a little bit. No, okay. Proceed. Proceed. Ah, there we go. Okay. I'm back. okay. So, so the information you're sharing with us now flies completely in the face of the main historic narrative that says when the settlers came here, there was no civilization, no skill set, no competence, and yet in a formal report that that went to the Netherlands. The basis for coming back was say we're coming to find a skilled people already doing that which history now claims we lack the skill for. So in other words, the first sanitizer, we think sanitizer is now popular with COVID. That was the first sanitizer where some of the history was sanitized. But continue, sir. Okay. So that's, I think that that's, that's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, so when Van Riebeek then arrives in 1652, oh, sorry, before that, um, imagine that you are the Dutch East India Company and these two captains, Captain Janssen and Captain Prout, who were stranded here in Cape Town for a year, they tell you, listen, this place is the place to have our refreshment station. These are civilized people, these are skilled people, uh, they can be trusted. What would you do? You sitting in Holland, your image that you have of the people down south is that they're a bunch of cannibals, they're uncivilized, and so forth. Yeah? Uh, so the, 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 the Dutch East India Company gets a second opinion about Cape Town. Is this a good place to go to or not? So who do they ask for the second opinion? Well, the best person to ask is someone who has been there. Someone who has seen the land and interacted with the people a little bit. And that person happened to be none other than Jan van Riebeek. Because he was here. So he, van Riebeek is then consulted. He's given the report written by these two captains. And he says, Van Riebeek, we need a second opinion from you about the viability of this land called Cape Town or South Africa, if you want to use that term. Tell us whether it's a good idea. Um, now, uh, Mr. Van Nel, I can't, I can't hear you. There may be a delay mm. in the... In the... Uh, 
Um, okay. Let me, let me tell you quick. Is, is it is it better is now? It, is it better now? Yeah, right. Yes. right. So now they consult so now him. They consult him. He puts his stamp, on, puts approval, his stamp on approval. And then they send back his expedition in 1652. Now fast now forward to ask for us a little to 1660, where you say where we you must say actually go back to. So from 1652 to 1660, it's a period of eight years. During those eight years, no, let me take a step back. Sorry, I have to just take you back a little bit. The main aim, the main objective that Van Riebeke had to do was to find cattle and to build a garden, a farm for vegetables. It just so happens to decide to use the land that the Koi and San people used for grazing their cattle annually. Is that the part? Is that the part that you explain in your book explain at in the your foot, foot of Table, Table Mountain? Of Table Mountain. That's right. On yes, the sir. slopes of Table Mountain. Yes, sir. The yes, most sir. fertile land with fresh water uh, continually available and the very lush areas on the slopes of Table Mountain. Correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So they arrive in April. Because you've got to get the timing mm. right. There's no one there in April uh, as far as the cattle is concerned because the cattle only come in December, November and December. And they come in their tens of thousands. To graze, they come to graze. They say, ah, Picked there's fierce. somebody here. Mm. So, a long story short, the I call it the the the, the hot and tot strategy was to find out whether these visitors are going to be permanent or whether they are going to leave. That's really the crux of the matter. And then, and then, in his journal, in April of 1660, you give us a horrifying recorder of what Van Riebeek writes in his own diary. He says that the Khoi has surrendered this land by the sword and we have no intention of returning it. So, so a war took place, you got to understand, a war took place the year before, in, in, in 1659, a full-blown war, and this peace summit in 1660 concludes this war. And Van Riebeek writes his perspective and he says, we the Dutch, we have won this war using the gun, using the sword, and therefore this land now belongs to us because we conquered this land using violence and the land now belongs to us. Now, now it's April 27, it's 1994. We would assume that the elephant in the room in relation to restoration and equality and equitable distribution of the resources of the land would mean that the land would be up most in the national discussion and then yet it's not reconciliation consumes us talk us through the failures of all the actors not just the government but also corporate commercial agriculture to drive land reform for 25 years before we arrive at expropriation okay so big agenda, for, uh, as you say, for 1994 was reconciliation. And, and to that, we must either blame or give credit to uh, Tata Mandela. The land issue was debated and the sunset clause, which then got embedded into the constitution was, there will be no expropriation of land, there will be a transfer of land based on a willing buyer, willing seller 
proposal. So we don't want the chaos that we've seen elsewhere in Africa. We're going to be orderly. We, the black people, are going to buy the land back from you, the white people. How that did, was the deal. How, and then how did willing buyer, willing seller play out? I have once read of a single case, for example, in Nelspreit, where a single family dragged the process for restitution so long, I think more than 14 years, but in the meantime, the value of the land increases annually, but they inflated the price so much that in the end, the government paid 1 billion rand to one family to buy the land back for the claimants who claim that land would you mind to just comment on that Yo, there's, not, there's nothing to comment uh, it's when it's when inefficient administration becomes your greatest enemy let's go back to the principle the principle of a willing seller and a willing buyer now i am a willing buyer i just don't have the money Okay, I don't come from money, I've got no collateral, so the government must help me. Because that was the deal they made. Uh, the speed at which these things happen is very problematic. So the speed and the lack of resources on my part are the two big disadvantages. And so 25 years later, you've got to ask how many of these willing buyer, willing seller deals were actually successful. Or if you ask it differently, how much land was bought by black people? So the answer to that would be almost nothing because the land ownership patterns that existed pre-1994 still exist today. Hey, Dr. Richards, Dr. Richards, Let's just help the viewer. So that is one aspect of land reform. That is land redistribution. But then there's also the other pillar, which is land restitution, which is not necessarily willing buyer, willing seller. That's where a family like ours, on both my mom and my dad's side in Douglas, we were landowners, both as Fanels and Morolongs. Landowners of very profitable uh, and suitable agricultural land on the banks of the Val and the Orange River. In fact, some of it at the, at the very confluence. My great-granddad had seven days to sell everything and leave. Today, a particular family in Douglas is exporting grapes from that farm to one of the provinces in France. So there's also the restitution process. Talk us through your view of where restitu restitution has let us down. Uh, restitution um, also presupposes a, a willing buyer and a willing seller. In this instance, the willing buyer is the state. The, the government buys that land from the white farmer and then gives the land to the previous owner. In this case, your, to use your example. So we restitute land back to you, restore it back to you. Now that's very different from someone who never ever lost any land, but wants to acquire property. Willing buyer, willing seller. It's the same principle, but there's a different beneficiary. So in your example, where you owned land, you lost it because of forced removals, because of apartheid. You are making a, a, a restitution claim to restore back to you the land that you used to own before these people came along. Of course, now you must take this discussion to a much bigger scale. Now it's not just the Fanel's land that they owned, but who were the people who owned the whole country before? And how do you give a whole country back to its original owners? That's the question. 
Sorry, I know you're supposed to ask the questions. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that is fascinating stuff. I don't think, uh, Doc, if you just want to come in here to check what's happening on the uh, on the comment lines and if questions are coming in, so you, you'll interject anytime when you're ready to do so. So viewers, I think you, you you can you can look and you can understand why Dr. Hendrick said he was as a child in a candy shop to host this colossus of a man, this walking, breathing encyclopedia on the subject matter. I thoroughly enjoy this, this yeah. conversation. We, 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 I'm just throwing the, the lever out there. Uh, for everybody watching out there, um, I'm, I'm watching the comments. Please let it roll. Ask questions. You've got such great guys in the studio here from a distance from Cape Town here. The Honorable uh, Dr. Ruben Richards, what a man, what a man, and I thank God for this man, and also Mr. Fanel. So please ask questions. Uh, we just have this hour to go, and this is a good time for you to ask questions. Now, for the sake of our viewers, I want to set you up now so that we can start discussing expropriation without compensation, which is the current bill before us, for which we have one day left to make comment. Government challenges in land reform is widely documented from poor policy to underfunding to lack of support to emerging farmers to corruption in the process setting land prices and so on can we put that aside for a second does white agriculture have a case to answer for their own inability to assess the land reform process. Go ahead, Sectic One. Um, uh, I, I, I cannot even pretend to speak for white agriculture, but uh, I just so happen to be a commercial farmer myself now with a white partner. Um, and so my, my access to this discussion um, comes from that perspective. My partner uh, tells me that he personally has taken on the challenge to make right that which was wrong in the past. Uh, and you know, we would need another program for, for all the things that he has tried to do. Um, giving land back to the workers, building houses, washing their feet, asking their forgiveness giving them the farm store, telling them the vegetables that they grow, they can sell through the farm store and take all the profit for themselves, etc., etc. All, all of those things uh, he has tried and he has done, and it hasn't worked. Um, and the reason it hasn't worked is because the one thing you did not mention in your litany of things from poor policy to underfunding to corruption is the issue of skills. People need to know how to work the land. It's one thing to own the land. It's quite another thing to work the land productively. Uh, and, and that's probably a, a level two debate, uh, but it's an important debate, particularly at the level of where I'm at now, at the level of commercial agriculture. At the level of, of, of um, subsistence farming, where you grow enough for yourself to survive, that's one discussion. And that re doesn't require uh, uh, as much skill as you would do it when you do commercial farming. Uh, I want us, I want, I want, us, I want, I want, I want us to get into the skills issue a little later. Uh, which I value as a, as a skills development practitioner myself. M my question is, let me rephrase my question. When we look at organized agriculture, uh, um, intergenerational agriculture, white agriculture, commercial agriculture, did they play the role naturally and from a proper historical context to say, but this is not just government's job to fix the original sin, to atone for the original sin, and to make right. Why is it that I feel that commercial agriculture must still be convinced of the moral and ethical basis 
that they must come to the table and do the type of things that your partner has done, not coerced by legislation, but simply by doing the right thing, by understanding historically how the land came to be in their possession. And I mean, we're talking of a largely Christian community here. Why are we struggling to make that point? The short answer is because there was no original sin committed. Ah, uh -huh. you got you, you, You're looking at a at a, a, a people for whom their current ownership of the land is legitimate. What what sin are you talking about? And so the. What, what I do in my possession. upcoming book. Uh, the, the sun uh, called dispossession. dispossession. Violent dispossession. No, no, there's no, there's no, there's no original sin. If, let me, let me, let me defend that part of the argument. It's called conquest. The rules of the game, the rules of engagement, if you're in the conquest paradigm, it says winner takes all by any means necessary. And so if I come in, you and I go to war, I conquer you with, with, with bullets, with swords, with guns, with... That land is now mine, legitimately, legally, and I entrench my victory in law. And there's a law now, together with a new geographical boundary that says, this land, that I won by the sword is now my land. It's entrenched in law. I've given it an earth number. It's mine. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? That is yeah, dangerous know. territory. Is 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 because that narrative then says to the vanquished, to the loser, what's your options when you in power? And that is why I specifically cited the moral, the ethical, and the theological basis for why a largely Christian community could not do the right thing. Because I want us to come now to expropriation. Your comment, please. We have to go back to first principles. When you when you play um, rugby, let's just, let's use rugby or, or soccer, whatever sport you choose, the rules of a rugby game governs the rugby game. And, and, and pardon me if I sound very very simplistic and pedantic here. You cannot play rugby using soccer rules. And when the person scores a goal in rugby, you cannot disallow the goal because in soccer, that's not how we score the goal. And that's the mismatch, the conceptual, the ideological and theological mismatch in this debate. Let me leave it there. You can push me. No, 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 no. I, 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 need you. I need you to explain that uh, because we have about twenty-five minutes left. I want us to get into the mechanics of the expropriation bill because there are sectors of the country, and especially white agriculture, who cries wolf now and says, "But uh, I want us to get to section twenty-five of the constitution so that the viewer is just on the same page with us." But I, I, we must sort out the fundamentals here. The fundamentals here is you say there's no original sin. The land is in the ownership of who it is as a result of conquest. I'm saying that narrative takes us into very dangerous territory because it can also fuel a counter rhetoric that says, so what is my options now? If violence put you in this favorable position, what are you inviting me into to reverse this? Because 26 years, 20, in 26 years, th they did not come to the table and, 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 and gave the, their laborers access. And, and I'm talking at a meaningful scale. I'm not talking about anecdotally like your partner who had the right heart 
his, 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 his theology is in the right place and they understand the ethics of this thing. I'm talking on a larger scale. Expropriation was not there in 1994. It comes 26 years later after all else failed. The last land order of 2017 placed 78% of the ownership of agricultural land in this country in white hands. Certainly that is unsustainable for nation building. I agree. I agree. So the question you're going to ask is, and I ask it in, in the opening paragraph of my book, I say, is, the, is the, the, the inequitable distribution of land the result of policy, wrong policy? Or is it the result of incompetence? So assume that we had competent officials in 1994 to drive the land agenda. Would we be in the situation we are today? I think the short answer would be controversially, no, we wouldn't. Because there is nothing in the, in the legislation that prohibited the efficient transfer of land. Now, 25 years later, it hasn't happened. So that's a fact. So now what do you do? Well, what are your options? You either get an efficient, uh, uh, what do you call it, administrator or commissioner or whatever that person is called, or you go the conquest route and you just take the land. Expropriation is nothing other than taking the land by force, which is how the land was lost in the first place. The question so that, that I post now, now. It's exactly the question that I post now. If, 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 if that is the prevailing narrative in existing agriculture, can I put the question differently? If my family, which is um, an upper middle class family, don't understand our blessedness and don't understand our responsibility to those with less. We are building a country where every school dropout becomes a future criminal who can harm that very same family. Now, let's go further to agriculture where vast and vast portions of that land came into the ownership of families intergenerationally that they've never purchased. And if they purchase, they purchase it for nothing as the fruit of forceful removals. Now, I'm saying the Afrikaner is a largely Christian community. I'm talking here as a, as a Christian now. So firstly, I'm asking you, is there a failure of the conviction of the Holy Spirit? Secondly, I say, is there a failure of conscience? to recognize how we came to own those 12 farms. We never paid market related. Uh, uh, we never had a real bond to pay off. It is the outcome of conquest. So I agree fully with you that government competence, incompetence, played a big role in where we are today. My question is merely, was government the only sinner? Or was the interlocutor also going out of their way to retard the process to share the land more equitably because in the absence of that lasting peace and sustainability and shared wealth is simply impossible sure i i, I don't disagree with you let's put our church hat on for a moment because the the, the church hat and the parameters of of discussion around conviction of the holy spirit an understanding of, of how God works in our hearts is very different from, it looks very different when you're in, in the broader society that has no regard for your spirituality. So let's stay with the church. You would hope and you would have thought that, that the, the, the vast of a number of farmers who claim to be Christian would have seen the world differently. Now, right there, you and I, as, 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 as persons of color, uh, 
we also have this exact same blind spot as the white guy because our world is driven by a different set of facts and information when we started the show i gave you a new set of facts and information about van ribi about the people that were here and what it does is it changes your point of reference revolutionary dramatically so when i talk to 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 the white farmers here in where where i live and where i do my farming and i have these kinds of seminars they are absolutely shocked to hear that the first nation people were competent cattle herders long before the white people arrived long before there's like a a, a brain shock of note and it then changes how we begin to engage with each other now there's a lot of work to be done now if i put my church hat on uh, and combine it with a with with the biblical new testament images of sowing and reaping planting sowing reaping and so on um, there's a lot of of ground work that has to be done before we even plant the new seed and that ground work is 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 what i've dedicated my life to do to go and scratch around for this historical information which seems to have been hidden or you call it uh, sanitized um from the general public um must just admit must just admit like dr hendrick said in the introduction you've done a marvelous job just a final question while we have the church hat on i want you to comment on my understanding of how god enters into covenant i cannot find a single biblical example where god ever entered into covenant where land was not part of the package Before God taught Adam a theology in Genesis 2, he gave him land in Genesis 1. Before he taught Abram a theology in Genesis 13, he gave him land in Genesis 12. God never had a covenant with anyone without land. As a black person speaking for 97% of black people, we are largely landless. We are Christian in covenant with God. and landless now with us is our white compatriots serving the same god understanding his covenant and their understanding of of god's covenant does not produce an unease in their theology that they coexist with their brethren who claim a covenant with god but is landless your comments please talk I'm sure that you have heard of the Kairos document uh, produced in 1985 and I in my young days I was I was part of that process and that document helps to explain exactly the dilemma that you are articulating and the label that you give to it is is state theology has to be converted which is why you have missions towards people of color and not missions towards white people there is no there's no history of black missionaries going to white communities to convert them to a different way of thinking that's just unheard of So so there's a much deeper theological discussion to be had around theology our conception of god our how we value or devalue our humanity as people of color and then 
you link that to land, oh my goodness, you're asking for a war. The purpose of the viewers, the do a short overview. What is expropriation without compensation? Just define it before we start to do a critique of it. Simple. I, I take away what you have in your position without paying you. Does the bill provide the bill under what circumstances? Does the bill provide for expropriation in its current form? Asking me now to put my legal hat on. I must be careful not to get into trouble with the legal beagles. Um, Thing but perhaps you can help that, that, that an 18-year-old, if an 18-year-old this morning is tuning in, or a 60-year-old like my mom, or who's a 70-year-old who, who has uh, very strong views on the land, just for a lay person, I just want to bring the lay person into the discussion so that when we say expropriation without compensation, before we critique it, um, just help that person to understand what parliament is trying to achieve with a new piece of legislation and why, in your view, they think that Section 25 in the Constitution is insufficient to attain um, new set of of uh, uh, land ownership ideals. Yeah. So the, 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 the soft end of, of the expropriation idea was to take land that is non-productive. So you have, you have farmers that have acres and hectares and hectares of land, um, a lot of which is non-productive productive and the idea as i understood it from some of the drafters and, and the legal people uh, who are interpreting uh, our constitution is that those pieces of land um, will need to be taken back because it's not productive it's not being used it's just laying there barren that we take those pieces of land back and and, and reconstitute that land there's a lot there's, of, there's a lot of criticism um, when it comes to accelerating land reform. One of those is food security will be undermined. One of those is we mustn't go down the route of Zimbabwe where only politically connected people end up with as the new owners of the land. And then one of those, especially from your more far-right uh, formations like Afri Forum and even some of your agricultural associations, is that it will chase away investment, in uh, localized investment into agriculture, but also foreign direct investment. Are those fair criticisms? Um, no. They're not fair because there is, it assumes that I, as a person of color, uh, am not competent or not able to be as productive with my farming as the next person. That's the underlying uh, negative value a that informs that debate. Yeah. Correct. It's a subtext. Yeah. So, so let's let's level the playing fields and let's assume that I am as competent as you are. The big difference is I don't have the land. I need land. And the land that my ancestors had was taken away from them. And so if we start competing as equals, guess what? Levels of, 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 of productivity will go up across the board. I want us to not lose sight of the fact that, that black people are assumed to be incompetent. And that flag is always used um, in, in these debates. If, if we take it out of Lampo uh, agriculture and we put it into a more familiar area of academia, 
of university education, um, and you and, and 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 you start comparing apples with apples. Are you telling me, Ruben Richards, the guy who, who, who started work as a clothing factory worker, who then became an artisan, who then finished international studies with a doctorate? Are, are, you, are you telling me that the factory worker was not ever going to be competent enough to be a professor at university? I love that I and I think it. that is so encouraging and challenging especially to our young viewers but also to our middle age viewers that it's never too late to commence with your studies to turn your life around we sit here right next to a man who finished his doctorate last year I won't disclose his age he can share that but what what just a vitamin B injection into reviving people's vision. Dr. Hendricks, do you want to jump in here with yes, some comments? Yes, yes, please. I would love to. Man, I'm enjoying this show so much. Thank you so much again, Dr. Ruben Richards. Really appreciate it. We have a few questions online and we've got our producer in here. And thank you so much again for your availability. You're such a great, great man. And we really appreciate you, man. We honor you. We respect you for who you are. And uh, I'm so thankful that our paths cross. I tell you, uh, there was there was just a a, a a lack in in the fullness of the puzzle that I think now we can start putting together again uh, before I get to the questions we've got two books and uh, I asked uh, last year sometime uh, Dr. Ruben Richards to send me a few of the, these copies I do have some of the copies left in the office it is uh, volume one and volume two on bastards or humans a book books to have on your shelf. The, these books answer all those questions that you were always, always, always um, uh, struggling with. And uh, it was really, really hard for all of us to bring the, 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 the puzzle together. But I must just admit, Dr. Ruben Richards, you're really the first guy, really, really, and I mean it. I don't know if that's also your, uh, your view as well, that uh, in the search for answers, yes. nobody really dig into this and nobody really get... Get factually, the, factually, yeah, not and emotionally. Yeah, you know what I like about it is like when when archive, when there's no archiving available here. Dr. Ruben Ruben, Ruben Richards man, managed to to get to archiving across the world, meaning get to Holland, wherever they had these things in archiving. My, I my. don't think people reckon that somebody ever would have uh, go to that extent to go and find information. That's highly, highly commendable. Again, we respect you, sir, and thank you so much. A few questions to you, and uh, Leandra will just uh, ask a few questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. This conversation is really heated. A lot of people are saying hectic. <laughs> That's the word that comes out. Hectic stuff. But um, there's a question here from Joni Hendricks. She says, um, and she is asking for your expert opinion and your knowledge on this, um, because she speaks under correction. So I'm just disclaimer. She says, how is it possible that land is not available for people of color who are obviously from South Africa, inhabitants of the land, but Chinese, for example, get land without tax. So that's the first question, and she is speaking under correction. So maybe if Dr. De Ruben and even so um, Mr. Fanel. Mr. Fanel can just jump on that and answer that. And then there's another question from Serrano Sammy um, that asks, is the land to farm or is the land for people to build houses? Yeah. Those are the questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ruben. Uh, we'll give leave that uh, two questions, and then uh, Mr. Fanel will continue. Right. The, uh, the question, if I forgot the name right, was from Joan. Uh, first of all, Joan, I, I, I hesitate to say that I'm an expert, but um, never mind. Land availability. Um, there is sufficient land on the balance sheet of the government. Enough land to be distributed to the previously disadvantaged. So, so, so don't be fooled if people say there is no land. Uh, I've worked very closely with the, the um, Department of, of Land Affairs or Rural Development and, and, and Land Affairs, as well as the um, Land Commission. Um, and they've told me, and I know that there's enough land so, so there isn't the scarcity. There's no, and the land is 
on the balance sheet, meaning it's owned by the government. You must remember that all the land that the white people stole, I'm going to use emotional language now, all the land that the, the previous government, the white people stole from black people, now belongs to the black government. It's on that government's balance sheet. It's not on the white people's balance sheet. Because we don't have a white government anymore. It's on the black government's balance sheet. So that's something to think about. Uh, the second question from Sammy uh, about farmland versus uh, uh, land for houses. Um, the, the land availability in the country, the, the, the challenge in the country is at two levels. We need to uh, land available for, for farming, for agriculture, but we also need land available for housing, for urban development. Uh, we have a crisis uh, at the level of housing. If you did not know, then let me tell you that by the time we reached 1994, there had already been a 30-year backlog in the building of houses for people of color. And that backlog was a matter of policy. It wasn't a, a, something that people just didn't do. It, it was an active policy of the apartheid government to not urbanize and build houses for people uh, in, in the urban areas. I have, I have a doc, I have a two doc, I final, very brief questions for you. One, can we achieve nation building without land reform? And two, why do you think the church has such a low appetite for discussing from the pulpit uh, and in general as individual believers the land question? Whereas it's so central in our Bible. Let me answer the second question first. The church's reluctance, I'm going to be very bold, the church is reluctant to talk about the land issues in South Africa is because the church is the largest land owner in South Africa. The church is the largest land owner. If you go back into the history, um, which is for another time, you will discover that that land was allocated and or bought uh, by the church in general, if you use the church uh, as a general term. The second, can nation building happen without land reform? The answer is absolutely not. Because land is what anchors your identity and it anchors you in terms of food security, sustainability and belonging. If you, if you are not able to attach yourself to a piece of land, you don't feel that you belong. And so the, the move should be to get as many people to own as much land in their private capacity as possible. And this is where we run into difficulties with our current government, who believe in a more centrist approach where the government owns the land rather than individuals. And that may be an unfair characterization, but it's certainly something to, to keep in mind when we have these discussions. From, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, we have a question from Bernard Lacoma, and uh, our producer just want to ask a question, and uh, we should answer all the questions. We promise them that we'll answer as much as possible. Most of the questions are um, fairly in the same style, or the, the, the results, the end results, or we covered it already okay. in the show, so we don't have to mention those questions. But there's one specific one that uh, that the producer feels like we should answer. So we're going back to the issue of the land. Um, who was the original inhabitants of South Africa, right? And a lot of people um, have the idea that it was the Khoisan. But now we've got this, there's a much contested um, debate going around. Um, is colored people Khoisan? Are they the descendants of Khoisan? So this is going back to the brown issue. And um, But now the question that Bernard has is, if the land belongs to the Khoisan, 
what are we doing then to give the land back to them? So that's the question. Luckily, the hot seat is in Cape Town today. <laughs> 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 this is a cold seat. <laughs> I thought you were on my side here. <laughs> um, so, Bernard, thank you for the question. Um, let me answer it this way. Nobody gives land back. Nobody gives land back. Now, it is fallacious to think that people are just going to give up stuff that they have inherited. Whether they inherit it legally or illegally, it doesn't matter. It's now mine. And so there's a set of rules that govern how you and I are going to debate and fight about this piece of land. The one rule says, what I've inherited is mine. There it is in law. The other rule says, we're going to change the law and we are not going to take that land from you forcefully. Well, change the law and then we'll see what happens. And that's really the, 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 the polar opposites of the debate. We have come to the unfortunate end of the show. I wish we had two hours or a seminar of a full day to just go and have a refreshment break and come back. I just want to thank you from my side before I hand over to the host here. And I must just also confess for the hijacking that I took <laughs> over. <laughs> I am so into these yeah. things. And uh, yeah. so, but thank you. Thank you, Doc, for the invite. It was lovely meeting you. Yes. I'm reading this uh, first volume now. I'm mm. in the third chapter in Lest We Forget. Mm. And I trust that our viewers had a great time. Yes. I trust that they are empowered yeah. and that they are also revived yes. and that they understand they are not an audience yeah. sitting in the stands yeah. about these things. Mm -hmm. These are not for them to discuss. Mm. It's for you to discuss, dear mm. viewer. Thank you, Doc. No, thank you so much. Well, from my side, I really, really want to thank you, Dr. Ruben Riches, for your kindness. And thank you so much for honoring us with your presence again. Um, uh, if you don't mind, um, we would love to bring you on board again, specifically around the books this time around. And uh, it, we, was, we were just fresh with a hot issue. And uh, there's a reason why I asked Mr. Fanel just to come online with me here and just help to co-host here the show here this morning. But we want to come back with the books. And if anybody's out there and you want these books, I do have a few copies. All that you have to do is to call the office on 011-494-494. 1363. There's the number, right? O double one four nine four one three six three. There's a few copies available. You should have this on your shelf. And then uh, um, I'm going to arrange with uh, Dr. Ruben Richards most probably towards the end of this month um, to have a book review and uh, get into the backdrop of this whole book and so on. Uh, Dr. Ruben, I just want to take this opportunity uh, to wish Mr. Fanel. Uh, a happy birthday. It was his birthday last week. And uh, we're not going to disclose anything about age at this point in time. But I want you to be part of the song. And uh, I'm not going to put you in the, in, in, into, into the shot with, uh, with a song. I don't know if you're in a, in, a, in a shower better than me. But I tell you, I'm good in a shower. But in public, <laughs> I just fail hopelessly. <laughs> I just want to let you know. So at this point in time, let's go. We're going to sing. Just join us in. Uh, happy birthday to Mr. Fania. Let's go. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. I hip hop! Happy! <laughs> A happy birthday, Mr. Arthur Fanel, from us to you. And then it's time to blow the candles. We count three, two, one, and there we go. <laughs> 
thank you so much from from our side here yeah, this is our staff here uh we've got uh, everybody that hosts shows here with you guys and uh they in the studio here with us and thank you so much for making this day so special to mr fanel we really 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 appreciate it and then also Aww. the what's on there uh mr fanel um uh, is clearly what god called you for and i wanted to depict this today in social justice and uh, this is a gift from us to you and we want to wish you well we want to let you know that we love you and appreciate you and thank you for the contribution that you constantly are making uh, towards the kingdom of god and making this relevant change and also the relevant issues that you discuss within uh, the church circles well what a great honor i think i don't think we'll ever forget the mere fact that on your birthday we had dr riches with us it was so good it's memorable for me and i really 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 appreciate it dr richard just stay on the line for mm -hmm. us we just want to sign the show out and then uh and then we just have a few uh, a, a, a short uh discussion or chat and then we'll be out uh for now from my side the inside show thank Can you so I much interrupt you yes you you may go i love you <laughs> <laughs> thank you yes That's I'll never forget this for as long as I love you. Yes. Yeah. God bless you, man. It's beautiful. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Maybe oh. if you if the viewers can just get a shot of that of the cake there. Cake of the car. I'm a, I must just say that Mr. Fanel doesn't look bad for 30 plus vet, you know? <laughs> bad for 30 plus vet. Well, from my side. Well, from my oh. side, I want to tune out. This is the Inside Show with Carl Hendricks. This is the show every Tuesday and Wednesday. We are live here and we are dealing with burning issues. And soon we'll have uh, Dr. Richard with Bastards of Humans online. You know what, uh, uh, Mr. Van Nell, it's a great... Uh, I just want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Ruben Richards. It, feel, it feels like I can also swear. So when I use the <laughs> title of this book, Bastards of Humans... <laughs> It just gives me a nice opportunity, man. It's like I just want to pronounce this. So we oh. can use that word as long as we say all humans. And, my, uh, and, and the spelling must be correct. Don't forget that. From my side, uh, I'm tuning out. Don't wow. forget, please, if you want us, if you want tune us wow. in, uh, subscribe, hit the bell. And every time when you hit the bell, you will know that we are online. From my side, I love you and take care. And you have a super Tuesday. Tune in tomorrow. We're going to do the TikTok generation. We're going to discuss about uh, the new name for a church, a theological, uh, rather a physical church and a digital church in combination, a digital church. That's what they call it. From my side, thank you so much. I love you and take care. You have a super, super Tuesday. All the best. Good morning, everybody. It is so good to have you here with me. Imagine if you have your vision as the car with the right team. Imagine how quick that vision will come into the footsteps. Something that was taking five years, takes three months. This morning is all about the leadership and influence. influence. My goodness, I would have never... <laughs>